Our next speaker is Dr. Frank Rogers, Jr., who is the Muriel Bernice Roberts Professor of Spiritual Formation and Narrative Pedagogy at the Claremont School of Theology. As a devout Catholic, he received his master's and PhD at Princeton Theological Seminary. He is a trained spiritual director and an experienced retreat leader. In addition, he has numerous publications on the interconnection between spirituality and religious education and the role of the arts in the spiritual formation of youth. His recent publications include The God of Shattered Glass and Finding God in the Graffiti. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Frank Rogers. Well, good evening. And I want to also express my gratitude for being part of this occasion and to be making so many new friends. Uh, Eba was kind enough to send me um, the book Audible Silence, and I thought, well, maybe I'll just read a, a story or two just to get a sense of who this gentleman was, Dr. Hatut. And I have to say, as soon as I started reading, I was so grasped by the stories, the eloquence, the simple wisdom, I could not put the book down. What an extraordinary human being this man was. Truly a man of peace, a man of reconciliation across the faiths, a man of forgiveness. I, I am very humbled to be able to participate in this celebration of him. And to be, to be sure, he is a man who knew how to nurture the spirit. He knew that at the heart of every single religious tradition, it's about transforming a, a heart of hate into a heart of love. I love that quote that Eba read from the Quran, that all that was asked of the prophet was mercy, in a word, mercy, compassion, love. I'm also taken by how similar that is in my own tradition. And I want to just paint a little portrait of some of the themes in nurturing the spirit from a Catholic perspective of a person who takes his coordinates from the teachings of Jesus. And I want to start by sharing a little story. When our son, Justin, uh, was about four years old, we were navigating life in the rather small confines of a one-bedroom apartment. And we were doing pretty good. Uh, we were transforming the living room table into a computer station and a Lego station. And uh, we were getting by pretty well until some of our best friends, a family of four from Seattle, were moving down into the area. And their house was just one day from closing. And they needed a place to stay. And of course, join us. We could spend the evening together in our, in our apartment. Well, one night turned into two, two turned into three, three into a week, one week into two, two into three. For a solid month, there were seven of us in this one bedroom apartment. And we were realizing just how strained friendships can become. And I think we were all doing the best of it. But Justin, he had it the hardest. I mean, here he was trying to share his dad. He was sharing his toys. He was sleeping in the living room floor while everybody else had the bedroom. But he was doing pretty well until one day he had it. He was playing outside our backyard. There was a sliding glass door from our living room and then a big mound of dirt where all the kids from the neighborhood would come and they would dig for dinosaur bones and dig for gold. And Justin had a shovel and there was a little boulder in the ground. He was digging away this budding paleontologist. It was a jawbone of a T-Rex. And he's digging it out of the ground when one of the neighborhood kids comes over, grabs the shovel out of his hands and starts to walk away. Justin grabs the shovel back and begins digging again. The kid is undaunted. He comes back, grabs the shovel, and the two of them go back and forth until the kid yanks it out of Justin's hands. Justin falls down onto his knees. He gets up. He gives this kid a look that could kill. And he stomps down the hill, slams open the sliding glass door, comes inside, slams it shut, goes into the corner with his little rocking chair, sits in the corner, folds his arms, and just begins to pout. And I'm sitting on the couch with one of our friends, and I say, Justin, uh, what's going on? He goes, I am mad. I am so mad, I'm never playing with my friends ever again in my entire life. Well, I knew exactly what that felt like at the time, and I said, that's okay, Justin, just kind of stay in the corner. 
Well, wouldn't you know it, but my godson, the, the son of these, these friends, uh, four years old also, he's playing Legos there on the living room table. He's oblivious to everything that's going on. We have the radio on. There's a commercial break. And then after the commercial, there's this music that starts to seep out of the radio. And it's the kind of music that starts to wrap itself around you. And without even knowing it, you're starting to bob up a little bit. And you're tapping your toe. And you're starting to sway. And this music, it's a, it's a Kenny G saxophone solo, if you know Kenny G. It's working its magic on little Jackson, who's got the Legos, but he's starting to bob and beep until he cannot stand anymore, and he jumps up in the living room, and he just starts to dance to Kenny G. And he's having a ball, and Justin's in the corner watching him, and Jackson says, hey, Justin, do you want to dance with me? And Justin says, well, sure, why not? He gets up, and the two of them start dancing in the living room. And for several minutes, it's like the ceiling has given way and the sun is shining upon us. They are aglow, doing a little do -si do a little John Travolta action. They get on the floor like the Three Stooges. They are having a ball, dancing in its radiant dance of life. Until the music ends, its melody still lingering in the room, and Jackson says, hey, you want to go dig for dinosaur bones? And Justin says, yeah, let's go. And they're running out the back door when I say, wait a minute, Justin, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to play with my friends. I said, I thought you were never going to play with your friends ever again in your entire life. And he looked at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then it hits him like it was a lifetime ago. Oh, yeah, he says. You know, I think the dancing took my mad away. And he went outside to play with his friends. There are Christian mystics who poetically describe that there is a dance that flows from the heart of creation. It's a dance that, that pulsates from the very heartbeat of God. It's a dance of love, of peace, of compassion. And its melody is woven into every dimension of our experience, ever playing, inviting us to pause from our busyness, linger long enough that we catch the rhythm of that melody, that we find ourselves moving in time with its music, and that we too become transformed that the mad in our lives gives way to healing, compassion, friendship restored. For me, this is the essence of spirituality. Spirituality is tending to the music of our lives and seeking to nurture our own rhythm to beat and move in harmony with this sacred dance that moves in time through creation. I understand the distinction so many make between spirituality and religion. I am religious, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, is a phrase that is often spoken in today's culture. And what is expressed there is religion is about the forms, it's the dogma, it's the practices, it's the symbols and the texts. To be sure, they are sacred. But they are sacred to the extent that the spirit of God breathes through them. I understand religions more as spiritual paths than religions. Religions are spiritual paths in the sense that they offer us a choreography ways of moving, dance steps, if you will, with this unbelievable invitation that as we move to these steps, we won't be rigidly enslaved to the form itself, but the form will open up and mediate for us this connection, this vitality, this participation with peace and compassion in the world. From my Christian perspective, that movement, that dance, has three fundamental movements to it. 
The first is it's a contemplative invitation. The Christian spiritual invitation is that we will pause from the labors of our day long enough to soak deeply in this profound reality that there is a sacred presence that holds all of creation. Howard Thurman is a spiritual writer, civil rights activist. He was in Albany, stationed for a few months, a place he had never been, and his apartment was just a few blocks downtown from where his office was. And every morning he would walk in the midst of the bustle to the office, and every evening when the work was done, he would walk through the bustle back to his apartment, until one day he had to work very late. It was like midnight. And as he walked out of his office, there was this profound quiet that permeated the city. He started to walk, and as he walked, he noticed that there was almost like the sound of gurgling water, flowing waters, like coming from under the sidewalk. He thought he must be hearing things, but it followed him all the way to back to his apartment. The next morning, he was so taken by that he asked the Albanites, you're not going to believe what happened. Could you understand this and explain it to me? And they said, oh, yes. Albany is built on a system of underground rivers. Those waters are ever flowing, but in our busyness, our hustle, our bustle, we cannot hear it until we settle and we're quiet enough that this water that is ever flowing is present to us. For Jesus, the presence of God is woven throughout creation. And God is absolute compassion. The essence of the sacred is love. And that love flows on all like the sun flows on the good and the evil, like the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The radical spiritual invitation that Jesus offered is that not only is that compassion ever present, but we can know that compassionate presence in our bones, in our experience, in the very heart of our own lives. We can taste and rest in this profound presence that soothes and heals like living waters. One spiritual invitation is one that Dr. Hatut knew so well. And that is by taking moments of quiet, taking moments of solitude, letting the, the busyness of life settle down like, like the silt in stirred up waters until it just settles into that profound presence that we all find ourselves in, the love of God that surrounds us like the ocean surrounds the fish. A second movement of spirituality is a regenerative movement. The spiritual life does not just invite us to sink our roots deeply down in this profound sense of a compassionate God. It also restores us into the fullness of what it means to be humanity in our essence. When Justin was a little bit younger than the story I told, he was about three or four months old, uh, we were visiting grandparents out in St. Louis, and we were at a mall. And I was rolling Justin in a stroller up and down the midway of the mall while everybody else was shopping. And after a while, I just kind of leaned up against a, a planter, and I was just kind of rocking Justin, and I was just kind of watching people. And Justin was at that age where he was just taking in everybody. And what I didn't realize was he was watching the people that are going down. And I looked off in the distance, and here comes this woman. She's probably elderly. She's probably retirement age. But what's striking about her is she looked like the angriest, closest, fiercest person I could imagine. Her whole cheek was completely clenched. Her jaws were tight. Her, she had a handbag in one hand, a shopping bag in the other. And she is marching her way down the middle of this mallway. Everybody sees her. All the people are getting out of their way because she's getting out of the way for nobody. What I don't realize is Justin is watching her too. 
His eyes big, taking it all in. She's twitching and moving her way down the hallway until she gets close to us. Without breaking stride, she just keeps twitching. She looks off to the side, and for a moment, their eyes lock. And Justin does the most extraordinary thing. He smiles. And when he smiles, all of the hardness of this woman evaporates. She lets out a sigh, gets down on her knees, and for several minutes, they are lost, giggling and cooing at each other. She's tickling them under the arm. He's grabbing after her glasses. The two of them are smiling, radiant. They're absolutely taking delight in the total stranger, but the beauty of the other person. People are gathering and watching these two people in this dance of radiance. Until for several minutes, she remembers, I'm there too. And she looks up at me and she says, God bless him. God bless him. And God bless you too. She grabs him and she walks away. For me, that woman and Justin are an icon of what it looks like when we are fully alive. A Christian saint, Irenaeus, has a phrase, the glory of God is humanity fully alive. God yearns that we be at the height of our powers, that we shine in the radiance of what we look like when we are in our gifts, when we are beacons of care and love, when we are connected to one another, when we are seen and beloved and someone smiles upon us with grace and care. We are alive and radiant. Christian spirituality has a very bad track record with self-denigration, self-abnegation, self-loathing. That is not the invitation of the spiritual path that Jesus invited us into. The spirit is that which wants to nurture us into a vitality that is fully alive. And a practice is to practice those things that make us shine. Practice that which lights you up. Practice that which embodies a compassion for yourself. Jesus said, love our neighbors as ourselves, not instead of ourselves. Many say, that's a rather low bar, because we don't love ourselves very much. The spiritual path that comes from Jesus invites us into a vitality that raises us up on the wings of eagles till we shine in what we look like when we are alive. The last movement of spirituality is that spirituality deepens us in the soil of God's grace. It restores us into a vitality of being fully alive and it sends us out into the world to be agents of compassion, justice, and peace. For Jesus, spirituality has a radical social agenda. He came to invite us into what he called the kingdom of God, a realm that was radically compassionate and gracious, where the stranger, the outsiders, even the enemies, are all welcome to gather at the table where the poor are fed, where the naked are clothed, where the oppressed are given dignity. And for Jesus, the test of spirituality is not how many mystical experiences we might have, or how many soaring heights of creativity we may know, or the depth of our ecstatic oneness with the universe. The measure of spirituality is the extent to which we embody compassion, justice, love in the world. A final image. A few years ago, here in Los Angeles, there was a Quaker Aikido instructor who was on his way to work, and he pulled up to a Starbucks. 
And as he was at the Starbucks waiting for his coffee to come, there was a gentleman behind him in the car who must have been in a hurry because he started to honk on the horn and as, because they were taking too long to get the uh, coffee served to this person. And as he looked in the rearview mirror, this Aikido instructor sees this man. He's like furious. His fists are pumping. He's just like anxious to go on and he's worried he's going to have a heart attack. And so what the Quaker Aikido instructor does is he looks at the Starbucks employee and says, I would like to buy that gentleman's coffee. He gave him an extra $5, and he drove away. This man drives up to the drive through and the Starbucks employee says, the man in front of you just paid for your coffee. The guy is so nonplussed, he can't believe it. So he says, well, here's $5 for the person behind me. <laughs> and that person gave $5 for the person behind them. For six solid hours, there was a line of kindness flowing through the Starbucks in Los Angeles. They were seeing how long they could keep it up. People were excited, running around the store. It was on the news, which is where I heard it. A little miracle of kindness spreading out into our world. That Aikido instructor was a man dancing to a different music than the one we normally move to. He was dancing to a movement of forgiveness, of compassion, of understanding in the midst of anger and violation. And as he moved to that music, he found that that music not only transformed the mad in our city for a while, it embodied the essence of what Dr. Hatut leaves for us. In a word, it's all about mercy, compassion, love. Practice that. Amen.